And this is Jeff Zeig, and here I am in the library of the Milton Erickson Foundation in Phoenix, Arizona. And this is a series of stories about Milton Erickson. Again, many of these stories have been printed, but I am now recounting them on video so that the people who enjoy watching and listening can enjoy some stories about Milton Erickson and some of the methods that Dr. Erickson invented that can be ec uh, extracted and applied in your life in the practice of counseling and psychotherapy, if that's what you're, what you're doing. So the the first day that I'm there, maybe the second day, I have come to Dr. Erickson because I think that he's going to teach me techniques of hypnosis and psychotherapy like I've been learning previously in my master's program in clinical psychology. And I had to memorize techniques and theories and research and I thought Dr. Erickson was going to teach me about some of the techniques that he invented, the confusion technique, the interspersal technique, using anecdotes and psychotherapy, which was really not being done in 1973 when I began uh, as a, a licensed therapist. And what I found was that Dr. Erickson was not teaching me about techniques. It was people building, it was Jeff Zeig building. And starting as painfully as Dr. Erickson did, it was hard for him to get started in the morning. And uh, you could see that he was struggling with the pain of the residuals of polio that he suffered. And I'm trying to analyze everything that he is doing and what it means. And I'm so enthusiastic about visiting with Erickson. And, Eric's, Dr. Erickson starts getting outside of himself, and I think I was useful to him because he had something to focus on other than his discomfort, and he got interested in me and was able to use that to surmount the difficulties that he was suffering due to the limitations and pain of polio. And within a couple of hours, I was exhausted from thinking, so it makes me think that perhaps one of the rules of determining the effectiveness of psychotherapy is there's, is it a, a transcendent experience for the therapist? Does the therapist um, access a, a, a different state that can be a benefit to the therapist? And the, uh, certainly uh, if I had any sense at the moment and understood, I would have just allowed him to work and do the things that he was doing to help to develop me, but at that time I was trying to analyze and understand. But then there became a moment where I, I was just so taken by him and I was so appreciative of the fact that in his impaired state he was taking his precious time and using that precious time to help me to be a better Jeff Zeig. And I remember at that moment there, there were tears running down my face and I said, uh, Dr. Erickson, you're the most impressive human being that I have ever encountered. And he quickly looked at me and smiled and said, oh, Jeff, I'm just another bo bozo, another clown on the path of life. And he didn't want to be on an extraordinary pedestal, even one that was made of marble. And he was focused on me and helping me to be a better Jeff Zeig. And I thought he was going to fill my left hemisphere with techniques and methods of psychotherapy. But Dr. Erickson was primarily a conceptual communicator. He was in the people building business. He was a great writer. And if you wanted to learn about his techniques, he wrote about those techniques. But in an interpersonal situation, he wasn't oriented to teach techniques. He was, he was teaching orientations, ways of being. And uh, some of those escaped me, and it's taken me decades to understand Dr. Erickson as being a conceptual communicator and not as being a didactic communicator. This wasn't somebody who would teach you the rules of chemistry or physics, but somebody who would help you to be a better human being. And in order to be a conceptual communicator, you have to orient toward. Now, people tab Dr. Erickson as being indirect, and then there became this 
what I would call confusion about what is the efficacy of direct versus indirect suggestions. But if you want somebody to realize a concept, you have to be orienting them toward that concept. If you want somebody to laugh, you can't explain algorithmically, there are four steps and you follow these four steps and then you're going to laugh. You give the person an experience, a joke, the implication of which is you laugh. And um, hypnosis is based in that. And Dr. Erickson, as a conceptual communicator, would orient you toward. So I'm there. It's the second day that I'm there. It's December 4th of 1973. And Dr. Erickson tells me a story. And it's a story about him teaching in the city of New Orleans. New Orleans uh, is very famous for its seafood, and he went into a restaurant and ordered one or two dozen oysters, raw oysters. And this is a lot for a single individual to consume, and this story is told in a rather slow and measured way where Dr. Erickson is enjoying the story, living the story, and also watching my response to this story. Well, when he had consumed 24 raw oysters, he ordered another dozen. Now, this is completely rare that any individual would consume 34 raw oysters in a restaurant in New Orleans, but having done that, he orders 12 more. Oh, this is unheard of that somebody has 48 raw oysters. And when he's finished consuming the 48 and enjoying the 48 raw oysters, he says to the waiter, bring me 12 more. Now at that moment, the waiter is cataleptic and is shocked that anybody wants to order 60 raw oysters. And Dr. Erickson looks at the waiter and says, 60 oysters? for 60 birthdays. And I indicate happy birthday, Dr. Erickson. The next day was his 73rd birthday. He was born in 1901, so that was uh, December 5th of 1973. So that was his um, 73rd birthday, 72nd birthday. I, I'm a little uh, confused at the moment. That was Dr. Erickson's way of telling me that it was his birthday. And curiously, being a reasonably good hypnotic subject, in many subsequent years, I sent cans of oysters to Dr. Erickson for him to celebrate his uh, subsequent birthday. And that was so unusual. Now, couldn't Dr. Erickson just say to me directly, Jeff, it's my birthday? But I think Dr. Erickson was practicing his orienting toward method, his way of being a conceptual communicator and perhaps like a, a virtuoso violinist who would practice scales over and over again, even though that person was a virtuoso, Dr. Erickson was practicing his conceptual communication, perhaps demonstrating to me how to be a conceptual communicator, but it wasn't, wouldn't be something that was taught algorithmically. It would be something that would be absorbed by me in a more automatic way maybe the way in which a child would learn a language, not by learning the rules of grammar, but by absorbing the language being involved in the language, so that language would be something that would happen on a more automatic basis. It wouldn't be transmitted through working memory to procedural memory. It would just automatically be involved in procedural memory. So um, that was a, uh, a moment that I recounted in the book Experiencing Erickson, which is available from Taylor and Francis Publishers. This is Jeff Zeig. Here I am in Phoenix, Arizona at the offices of the Milton Erickson Foundation. You can look forward to installment number four of Stories About Milton Erickson.